All right, James. Welcome back. Uh, we're back in person. It's James and I coming for the uh, IHB podcast. So, uh, how was your adventures in Las Vegas? Expensive. Yes, I bet they were. But Jimmy's a high roller. We all know that. I wish. <laughs> but, hello everyone. My name is Dominic Moore, and I want to thank you for tuning in to the second, possibly third best thing you've heard all week. We have a great show for you today that includes top-notch movie news. We have some pretty big stories this week, James. I don't know if you know, read my notes or not. No, I did not read your personal notes. Of course you didn't. You didn't <laughs> send them to me. That would just be wrong. That would be like cheating on a test if I sent you my notes. We've always cheated on tests. A little bit. <laughs> but anyway, this is the I've Had Better Movies podcast. Let's kick it off. James what do we have first for the fans this week? All right. The first story. The Hollywood Reporter is saying that the community and the Martian star Donald Glover is in early talks to star in Spider-Man Homecoming. Aside from his acting and music career, many fans became aware of Glover back in 2011 when he publicly proclaimed he wanted to be the new Spider-Man, inspiring thousands to sign a petition to get the casting accomplished. Of course, the role went to Andrew Garfield, Martin Starr and Logan Marshall Green have also been cast as possible villain roles. On a scale of 1 to Margot Robbie, what are your thoughts on the potential casting? On a scale of 1 to Margot Robbie, I think I'm about like a 6 and a half. Because it all depends on what roles all of these characters are going to play. The one I'm most interested in is actually Logan Marshall Green. Because rumors are that he's going to play the secondary villain to... Michael Keaton's The Vulture. So that's interesting to me. Um, I think he's a good actor. I wasn't a huge fan of Prometheus, but I did like his performance in it, as short as it was. Uh, if I had to cast him, I would hope that he's playing like um, a villain called uh, Shocker, who, despite the sexual innuendo now they use for those names uh, in today's society, he's a kind of B-level villain who... I'm most familiar with from the animated series that came out when we were kids. He's kind of a bumbling idiot. Like He usually gets his butt kicked pretty easily, and he has these gloves that basically emit shockwaves and stuff like that. But the problem is, it's a little similar to Jamie Foxx's Electro from Amazing Spider-Man 2. Or he could be playing a guy like uh, the Scorpion, who has this exosuit style thing where it has a tail and can spit venom but then again that's a little close to the rhino from amazing spider-man 2 and a little close to the lizard from amazing spider-man 1 so truthfully i'm not really sure who this guy's gonna play he could be playing somebody out from left field like uh mysterio or something like that so who's mysterio he is i think it's mysterio it could be mysterio i don't can't recall exactly some sort of mystery yes but uh he is a former visual effects expert for movies who turns to a life of crime and then uses these enhanced, like, uh, essentially Jim Cameron, the James Cameron. I like to call him Jim. <laughs> I, I know who you're referring to. <laughs> well, for those who aren't, who gave uh, equally weird looks as uh, Jim did for that, James Cameron, as in he uses these elaborate visual effects that basically project in front of people in order to rob banks and stuff like that he creates these like light cubes that you throw and creates gotcha. a three-dimensional environment so like tupac appearing yes very tupac-esque uh so he, that's been somebody who's been rumored for years for a spider-man movie or you never know maybe he's playing the chameleon who can shape shift and stuff kind of like mystique from x-men Okay. So there's there's a long list of who he could be playing. Glover's a little different. He, I I don't really know who he's going to be playing. I don't know the size of his part. If it's sizable, I hope he's a villain. If it's just a walk-on, I'm going to be a little disappointed. I think he's a talented actor. I'm not crazy about some of the stuff he's done lately. He's gone a little too wacky and weird for me. Hey, I have a feeling Donald's gonna, Donald Glover's going to be a friend of peter parker and kind of just that throw in i don't know if he's gonna have too big of a role i don't know though but he's a little old to be friends you have to remember that spider-man in these movies is only like 16 
Yeah, but he could play someone younger if he had to, couldn't he? Okay, you think he can play 19? Yeah. I don't know. I think he could. He's like 33. He's got a baby face. Okay, if you say so. But he could also be playing somebody who we've seen before in a Spider-Man movie. Shock and awe across James's face, despite the fact it's a radio podcast. Uh, he could be playing Robbie Roberts, who, if you remember from the Sam Raimi trilogy, he is kind of the number two to J. Jonah Jameson's. He was a slightly overweight African-American, and he would be the one who's like, no, Spider-Man's a good guy. Stuff like that. Mm. Mm, yes. By that, mm, you can tell James knows exactly who I'm talking about and will be well informed on his next point. Yep. <laughs> so he could be somebody we're playing. We haven't heard any rumors about who, if there's going to be a J. Jonah Jameson in this movie, so there's always that. Uh, Martin Starr, he'll be some scientist lackey to the bad guy, I'm assuming. And Hannibal Burris, I think, will definitely just be a cameo role. He's going to be a teacher at the school or something. How about your thoughts on the casting? I agree with you. Logan Marshall Green was good in Prometheus. Um, I don't really know him from the, anything else. Mm-hmm. Martin Starr, I could care less if he's in it. <laughs> I like him in Silicon Valley. Yeah, Silicon Valley, he's funny. But I don't know if he's going to be that same character. And then too bad uh, Marco Robbie's not in it. Because that would make the movie all that better. Speaking of Marco Robbie, though. Uh, Variety is saying that the actor is attached to play the infamous Olympic figure skater Tanya Harding in an upcoming biopic entitled I, Tanya. Finest Hours director Craig Gillespie will direct the project. Would you rather see this movie or take a metal pipe to the knee, James? Metal pipe to the knee, that's that's aggressive. It is. But um, when you want to win in Olympic level figure skating, that's what you're willing to do. Tanya Harding was. <laughs> Allegedly. Only the fiancé, Robert Galuli or whatever, was uh, ever convicted. That's true. Have they made a movie about that? This would be the first one, right? I mean, it's, they might have done like a Lifetime movie or something like that, but this is the first like theatrical movie. Okay. It makes sense that they're ready to make this movie because 30 for 30 came out quite a couple years ago now. And I think that stirred up a lot of attention again for people that are a little bit younger that didn't know about it. Mm-hmm. And do we know who she's going to play, Margot Robbie? It is Tony Harding for yes. sure. <laughs> who do you think uh, will play Nancy Kerrigan? That's a good question. And it's an important question because um, my thoughts on the movie, I think it's going to be a good one. I think if it's treated the right, right way, it's got Oscar worthy written all over it. Because watching that 30 for 30, it was a good documentary. And you saw how desperate Tanya Harding was. Because she grew up on the wrong side of the track. She was a trailer park kid who had to work for everything she had. Skating at the public rink. She wasn't like the bred-to-be Olympic skater that Nancy Kerrigan kind of was. And while Nancy Kerrigan certainly wasn't like a bad person, it just saw, like you saw what... Tanya was how much it meant to her. So that makes me really excited for this. And I think that Margaret Robbie's great casting. She's probably a little tall, but with movie magic, they'll fix that. Yeah, that's. I don't think that's that big of a deal. Yeah. As far as casting of Nancy Kerrigan, that's a good question because it's going to be important who it is. Because you're going to have to have that chemistry there to where you're either going to have to, they're either going to have to make everybody in the movie love her or kind of hater, or that perfect mix of you want Tanya to win, but then have that turn where it's like, yeah, but she deserves it too. To where when she does get knee- capped in the knee, it makes sense. And you allegedly, ale- well, she definitely got capped in the knee. That definitely happened. <laughs> the question is whether it was Tanya Harding involved in it. So it'll be interesting who gets cast for uh, Nancy Kerrigan. Also, who gets cast for Jeff Galuli, the. Um, Pipe wielder, wielder himself. What do you think about Amelia Clark? Too short? Uh, I think too short and too chesty. Okay. To be honest. All right, all right. Um, Emily Blunt would probably be great, but then again, we say Emily Blunt for every role. She's a little, she too old, though? I don't know. They, she might be, but I think she would be fine. Because Nancy Kerrigan, like, she, she didn't look incredibly young from the documentary that I saw. Yeah. She did. I mean, I think Tanya Harding looked younger. Yeah. For sure. I mean, also, how old's Margot Robbie now? She's like 28, right? 25. 
Oh, shit. No, she's the same age as me? She was born in 90, so she will be 26. What the fuck? <laughs> July 2nd. Oh, that, that, that hurts. She's so attractive, and I am so not. <laughs> Don't be so hard on yourself. Oh, well, let's... Well, Forget you. When we're comparing me to Margot Robbie, it's okay to be like, yeah, no, you're a piece of shit. <laughs> I didn't want to go that route. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'd, I'd love the idea of the movie. Uh, the director, I wish it was in a little better hands. Somebody with a little bit more credit behind him, especially with The Finest Hours being the last project he did, which wasn't extremely well perceived. Missy Peregrine would be a great casting. I love her. She's on uh, Rookie Blue. I think that just got canceled, but... She was really good on that. Stick It is one of my guilty pleasure movies. Oh, is, that's where she's from. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. I'm in. Yep. That's a good find. Thank you. Random or you just happen uh, across her picture? Most popular celebrities. Really? She's up there? She is number 26. Good for her. Good for her. Probably because her show just got canceled. Probably. So what do you guys think of the potential Tanya Hardy movie? Do you remember the event that actually happened? Did you see the 30 for 30? Let us know in the comment section below, or you can hit us up on Twitter. That's at IHB Podcast. James, break it down with the next story. Variety was reporting that... I said break it down. Drop a beat. I don't drop beats. (laughs) I've never dropped a beat in my life. (laughs) I've dropped the ball, but but not the beat. (laughs) Well, we drop the ball weekly on this podcast, so... (laughs) It happens. Variety is reporting that Mandela, Long Walk to Freedom, director Justin Chadwick, is in negotiations to helm Anthony Mackie's untitled Johnny Cochran biopic. The film will be centered on the 1981 wrongful death case of college football star Ron Settles. Signal Hill police ruled that Settles had hung himself in a city jail cell in despair over his arrest for speeding but Cochran suspected foul play and persuaded the Settles family to request that the body be exhumed for an autopsy, which showed Settles had been choked to death. Yeah, um, before we go any further, full credit to Collider Video slash Collider.com for that read. Um, I fully admit it that I just took their words and wanted to reuse them because I'm not familiar with this situation. I wanted to make sure I didn't get any... In anything wrong so after you check out this podcast go ahead over to collider videos that uh, their channel and check out some of their great content just so we don't get sued yeah please <laughs> this story is th- i find this movie interesting first of all take the names out of it uh the johnny cochran's and the ron settles it's an interesting story yeah so from a movie perspective it's solid but then you add the names in and it takes a little bit of a different turn. Because truthfully, I had no idea that Johnny Cochran basically did any other case. Obviously, I know he did because he's a professional lawyer. But when you think of Johnny Cochran, when I think of Johnny Cochran... O.J. Simpson. Yes. So, I feel like people might get fooled. Not exactly fooled, but uh, mistaken when they go into this movie thinking like, okay, it's another O.J. story. Yeah, this is where they have to be careful with their marketing um, and their trailers, teasers, all of them, mm-hmm. because if they just leave it as a Johnny Cochran thing, everyone's going to think it's about OJ. Oh yeah, for sure. And I mean, are they going to even touch on OJ? Cause it, it's technically not biopic. Um, well this was 81, so it's a solid, what, 10, 15, 10 or 14 years before OJ. I've got the list of other people he represented. Sean Combs during his trial on gun and bribery charges. Michael Jackson, Tupac, Todd Bridges, Jim Brown, Snoop Dogg, Riddick Bowe, and then the 92 Los Angeles riot victim, an in- inmate activist, and then Marion Jones, she's faced with charges of doping. Really? really? He represented Marion Jones. Interesting. Yep. Yeah, so 13, uh, so it took, yeah, we just confirmed it took place 13 years before. So I doubt they touch on it. But given the list that uh, you just named, realistically, maybe we'll get a Johnny Cochran series? <laughs> like, yeah. Multiple films? Um, okay, going away from the idea of Johnny Cochran, what do you think of Mackie as potential star? I'm okay with it. 
I think he's uh he's able to do that. He's had a couple movies where he's been the uh, lead, right? Yeah. He, I mean, he was arguably a lead, uh, one of the three leads in We Are Marshall. He had a leading role in that HBO movie that just came out not too long ago, didn't he? All the way. Yeah. So, I think he's got some dramatic chops. I'd like to see him do a little more. I like him as an actor. Yeah. I think he's great at comedies and stuff like that. Although, no, he was he's, he definitely has dramatic traps because he, uh, he was good in The Hurt Locker. Yeah, very good in The Hurt Locker. Triple Nine, he was okay. He was uh, okay. Pain and Gain. I thought he was funny in Pain and yes, Gain. Yes, he was very funny in Pain and Gain. Um, but what do you guys think of this movie? Does the idea of a Johnny Cochran film not based around OJ entice you? Are you a little tired of OJ and Johnny Cochran yes. from all the series we've had on TV and things like that? I mean, but, I think ESPN just came out with a five-part... Yeah, their 30 for 30 version of it. Yeah, so are you on a little bit of Cochran overload? Have you had way too much Cochran? How many more jokes can can you do? Several. (laughs) Jimmy just... He's got Cochran on the tongue. All over my tongue. (laughs) Uh, Let us know what you think of the idea of this movie on our Facebook page. That is the I've Had Better Podcast Facebook page. All right, next up, The Hollywood Reporter again has released a story this past week that Gerard Butler will be reteaming with his London Has Fallen writer, Christian Goodgast, fingers crossed that's how you say it, for a bank heist crime thriller entitled Den of Thieves. Why did I put the name in the read twice? I don't know, but Goodgast will direct the project and STX Entertainment is developing the film. Are you falling for the London Has Fallen reunion? Ah, ah. Ah, clever. <laughs> Only if they know what they're doing, mm-hmm. and if they try to make this movie way too complicated, which I have a feeling they're going to, just from the description. Which is while planning a bank heist, a thief gets trapped between two sets of criminals. With that being said, I think there's too much complication to a plot, and there's a possibility Gerard Butler might mess this up. This is awful. This is going to suck, and I know it. Uh, first of all, the fact that the writer of London Has Fallen is directing this film is insane. Like, how did he even get this shot? Because short of him, like, I'm not sure about the situation on London Has Fallen, but that movie was so poorly written for 80% of it, I can't believe this guy even got another job. Like, the way he treated Angela Bassett in that film, her entire arc slash the character that was built with her, that writing was awful. Um, everything with Gerard Butler himself up until basically the, they stopped talking in the movie was awful. Up until the shooting started happening. like But the real shooting, not the CGI crap that they did in the beginning. I just, I don't get it. So I have very little faith in this movie. It sounds like a B-level. Just when I thought Gerard Butler was kind of making his way back. Possibly C-level. Yeah, he, he comes out with something like this. Now, you get... Some great casting on the out of the two, what does it say, gangs or two criminals? Two criminals. Uh, you get like awesome casting out of those two that can up this movie a little bit and take some of the weight off of Gerard Butler. I'll be back in, but as of right now, this is I wish I could make fun of this more. Yeah, I mean, he hasn't written, he hasn't directed any of any movies, so this would be his first director, um, debut, Mm -hmm. and the only other. I think good movie that he had any part in was A Man Apart. He wrote that one. Yeah, even that movie, like, it gets a little bit too much love because that is a tough sit to wa- to watch. I don't know if you've seen it lately. Uh, and A Man Apart is the Vin Diesel movie that came out shortly after. 2003. Yeah, Fast and the Furious. It's when he kind of wanted to do a more dramatic turn and tried to become an actor instead of just the, hey, I drive cars and I say cheesy one-liners that he's good for. So hey, I live my life a quarter mile at a time. It's not a cheesy line. <laughs> no, but that was the last decent line ever in a Fast and Furious film. It was in the first movie, Dom. What Ex- do you mean? Exactly. <laughs> All right, so um, yeah, they did I, like eight more after that. Yeah. Seven more. Seven more. But there's gonna be nine more. That's true. Yeah. Um, so 
I, I sell it. Uh, I kick it down the road. I give it up for adoption. Whatever you want to say for this story, I don't want it. Give it up for adoption? What's wrong with you? <laughs> this t- How could this, you do that to a child? This took a dark turn. <laughs> Helen fucking Mirren will star in Fast and Furious 8. Yeah, what? I said fucking. Mirren revealed the news herself in a recent interview with Elle magazine, saying that while she wants her roles to be serious and pertinent, she wanted to do the film just for the fun of it. And she has always loved driving. Interesting. The legendary actor even told filmmakers she would only do the film if she was allowed to drive the car. Thoughts on Mirren in Fast 8? Well, normally, I am not a fan of top-level actors doing these weird movies. Like we talked last week about Anthony Hopkins being in Transformers 5. This is a different situation. 99% of it is because it's Helen Mirren, and for some reason... Bad movies just completely wash off of her. Like, she was in both of those Red movies. Yeah. And I thought she was really good in those movies. Like She was good. And those are bad movies. Very and, bad like, movies. The, the stink doesn't stay to her. So... I agree. I, I think... But, all right. So, if we go this route, what if Fast 8's terrible? Is she just the only good part in Fast 8 again? No. Because I... Well, A... I don't think it will be terrible. I don't think it will either. No, I think it'll be just as good as 7, which was a bad movie. But because it's Fast and Furious, and they know what they are, it's a good movie. Like, they steer into the skid. And they know, like, when Dwayne The Rock Johnson picks up a minigun with no real trigger. I don't really know how he's shooting it, because didn't he, like, take it off of a car or something? Like where's the trigger on that gun? Does it matter? And just starts firing. If, if that's the only, if that's the biggest problem you point out in that movie, and I'm okay with that. Well, I mean, there was also an issue in with the major fight scene between Jason Statham, where he's fighting with like a crowbar, and Vin Diesel is fighting with a wrench, and they decided to go lightsaber battle with it. Like that was weird. That was weird. Yeah. So How about them jumping like four buildings. Yeah, that was <laughs> while while I was watching that, I was like, all right, they did it once. Oh my god, they're doing it again. <laughs> no, wait a minute. They're doing it one more time. <laughs> yeah, so that was pretty crazy. But Helen Mirren in this movie, I actually I, I dig it. I'm all in about it. I, I love Helen Mirren. I like it when she takes these little bit odder roles. Um I mean she's a top level actress. If you haven't seen The Queen, then you haven't lived. Is she gonna be a villain? I don't know. Is she gonna be like Jason Statham's mom? I was thinking Charlie's Theron's mom, but in all honesty, I'm not even kidding here. And this is going to sound weird. I so want her to be a love interest of Ludacris and Tyrese. Ooh. Yeah. Because they got drunk one night in London and things like, happened. Kind of, yes. Or I want her to be like, um, I don't remember the girl's name because she's a throwaway. I think she's just a model actress or whatever. But the British hacker chick from... Uh, Fast Seven, Natalie Emanuel. Sure, Natalie Emanuel. Um, Who is in Game of Thrones? Is she really? Mm-hmm. She's uh, Khaleesi's uh, the assistant interpreter. Yes. Yeah. Um, anyway, she in that movie, what? Well, not exactly a love interest. Like I don't think she ever gives anything back. But Tyrese and Ludacris are kind of fighting over her, and like they're trying to like um, be all macho in front of her that way. She will like one of them, and at some point, I assume, you know... Would be funny. Do the dirty. Not realistic, but it'd be funny. I think it's absolutely... Helen Mirren, again, this is gonna sound weird, because she's a bit of an older gal. You ever seen that girl in a... Older gal? You ever seen her in a bikini? No. Google Helen Mirren in a bikini. Do it right now, James. Live on the air that's technically recorded. Now we're getting confusing. Come on. This is weird. You... She's kind of hot. And how old is she? She's born in 45. Why are you making me do math? Because <laughs> I can't do it either. She is 76. No, 71. 61. <laughs> how old is she? <laughs> <laughs> she? Okay, she was 55 in 2000. Yeah, she's 71. It's just like you question yourself. Because you, you gave, like, I didn't get the confirmation in your eyes because no. you didn't do the math. And I'm like, no, I'm wrong. The reason you didn't get confirmation is because you said she's 76. And I'm like, 
Wait a minute, really? 76? Okay, 76 versus 71. Is there a big difference? No, that's my point. There's no big difference, but I'm just realizing how old she was. Yes. Is. And now the bikini pic is like, whoa. Yeah. Plus, it's about time we get some of the very attractive older women like as the sex interests. Instead of cast another 22-year-old. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Plus, she's funny. I think they could do some really great things. Or, like you said, if they have her come back in and she randomly hooked up with Ludacris or Tyrese in the past. And they did, like, and she's like, oh, you don't remember the drunken night? Yeah, I think that'd be funny. Yes. So, I I love the idea of her being cast. But, if they choose not to go that way, I could see her as being in, like, a high-end street racing group like because we haven't seen that yet you see like the normal street racing that you know well a version of it that you see like the gangsters and like the normal people who have it but they haven't showed that like because rich people are famous for doing it too like they buy million dollar cars and they will drag race them Mm -hmm. so it would be cool to see her in that situation too i agree driving uh some english car oh yeah absolutely any final thoughts on the matter no well i'm a little concerned how excited excited you were to see her in a bikini, but listen, we can move on. She's that. a very attractive woman. She's seventy six, seventy one, seventy one. I, I dare you to like anybody out there. I dare you not to look at that picture, which I will be putting in the podcast video, and not think like, yeah, I'd get it. Plus, think of the stories, think of the experience. I'm not doubting her experience whatsoever. She's probably very talented. All right, James, for our next story. We here at IHB spoke in one of our earliest episodes about Ben Affleck's next directorial project, Live By Night, which tells a story of early bootleggers. But now, it appears the project will be getting a new release date. Instead of an October 2017 release, the film is now set to hit theaters January 13th, 2017. What do you make of the switch? I think it is a good move because, well... I don't know. It depends how you look at it. If they go the route of The Revenant and try and set this up for an Oscar-type movie, um, it is good, but it is a little bit late, and I'm just curious if they're trying to do that same path of trying to stay away from December um, because it is pretty movie hectic. I understand that concept, but January 13th is so weird to me. Like, if you're... If you're cause... The Revenant, I believe, came out the first week of January. Like, January, like, 8th or something like that. I didn't think it was that late into January. And also, traditionally, January is a dumping ground. Like, it is kind of our last true dumping ground that we have. So the idea of... I I wonder if they're worried about this film, maybe. Maybe it's not as good as some people thought. And plus, The Revenant was weird because it came out in in, uh, a limited release initially yeah because the rules are in order to qualify for the oscars you have to be showing in at least five theaters in la and new york before the end of the year but the week that of january 22nd that weekend uh the revenant was top top movie at the box office it was released january 8th guess what its weekend gross was what was it 16 million. Number one. And that's, what, two weeks after? Yeah, and that's January. Yeah. Just goes to show January is not a good month. Yeah, so the January 13th date scares me. Maybe they're trying to squeak it in a year early for Oscar nods, but if I had to guess, more than likely, it's because they no longer have faith in this movie. Not a good sign for Ben. No, not really. But then again, who knows? I mean, still a really good cast. Yeah. I mean, Elle Fanning, Scott Eastwood, Zoe Saldana, Ben Affleck, Sienna Miller, Anthony Ma- Michael Hall, Titus Welliver, Brendan Gleeson, yeah, so, well, Chris I mean, Cooper. It's going to get interesting. We'll see if it pays out. Yeah. Next up, we have the section of the podcast with uh, some of the stories we didn't quite have time for or things that are uh, kind of self-explanatory about the title. Uh, we affectionately title this Crap We Didn't Have Time For. Uh, first up on the list... We have the Lego Movie 2 getting bumped back to February 8th, 2019. Harrison Ford will not die in Indiana Jones 5. Oh, thank God. I can't go through that again. (laughs) 
Zac Efron is in talks to star in Barman Bailey's circus biopic, The Greatest Showman, on Earth, opposite Hugh Jackman. Steven Spielberg is working on a remake of West Side Story. And Lady Gaga is to star opposite Bradley Cooper in a Star is Born remake. James, of this list, which one is most interesting to you? Zac Efron and Talks to Star in the Barnum and Bailey Circus biopic. All right. What intrigues you about it? Because Hugh Jackman, I think, is, is perfect for the circus. I think he, he did a great job in um, the French Revolution movie, which is escaping me again. Les Mis? Yes, Les Mis. And, I, and he did a nice job in uh, the Magic movie with Christian Bale. The Prestige? The Prestige, yes. And I feel like this is a combination of both those movies. And Who doesn't like Zac Efron? A lot of people, actually. (laughs) They're all wrong. I agree with you. I think that movie sounds interesting. I'm actually one of the people who like Zac Efron, so... uh, And especially, I like seeing Hugh Jackman branch out, so this could be an interesting movie. Now, the one most interesting to me is the Lego movie getting bumped back. Just because I really liked the first one. I liked it a lot. I thought it was a great movie, and... I'm worried a little bit about them losing their buzz, kind of, with, I mean, it's going to be, what, four years after the first one came out? Come out in 2015 or 2014? 14. Yeah, so four years later, that's rough. Like, that's pushing Avatar area. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I hope I hope that it's only a good thing and maybe there's just some scheduling issues with how many people they're trying to fit in this because of it's a lot of cameo voices. But it's voices. Yeah, I know, but it's one... You could do that in a day or two. Yeah, but it's also one of those things where Chris Pratt's a busy guy. Maybe, like, because he's got Guardians, maybe he's got sub- He's got Jurassic World 2, he's got Avengers coming up and stuff like that, so we'll see. Possibly Indiana Jones? Possibly Indiana Jones. The one that everybody has the finger crossed for, but so far, considering what the other note in here, Harrison Ford ain't dying anytime soon, that's a little up in the air. All right. And now comes the favorite section of the show where we reiterate stuff we've already said. But, uh, James, it is pick it and kick it. What is your pick it for the week? Helen fucking Mirren. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that one's pretty easy. Yeah, it was was a no-brainer. Yeah. I mean, what's not to like? Yeah. We already went over this. Yeah. I I generally try to say a different one uh, for my pick it too. But I mean, I I love the idea of Helen Mirren in the Fast and Furious universe. All right. So we're on the same page for the pickets. Yeah. How about you kick it? The new Gerard Butler, Dan of Thieves, or Den of Thieves. Yeah. Not going to work. Yeah. I think I already gave my thoughts on it when I offered to give it up for adoption. So uh, (laughs) uh, my other, my kick it though, it's going to be Donald Glover being cast in Spider-Man. I don't particularly like it. If he plays a major role, I hope it's a villain, but if it's not, if he's a good guy, I think he's going to overshadow the movie a little bit, and I want the center to be on Spider-Man, so uh, I'm going to kick this movie. Makes sense. Yeah. All right, well, that was our show for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. We came to you guys a day later than usual with the Saturday episode, but uh, just the same amount of quality and just the same amount of effort. Very minimal. (laughs) But I want to thank you all for tuning in. If you enjoyed the show, please like this episode and subscribe to the I've Had Better Podcast Network. Also, you can follow us on Twitter, at IHB Podcast, and on Facebook, go like the I've Had Better Podcast page. James, tell the people where to find you. You can find me on Twitter at the underscore Kaiser underscore Soze, or on Facebook as Jimmy Langos. And please check out the website, www.ihbpodcast.com. And please subscribe and listen to our iTunes. All right. And you can find that by just going to iTunes and searching IHB Podcast, IHB Movies, I've Had Better Podcasts, any combination of the two, three, four, whatever number I said. And uh, as always, I am Dominic Damore. You can follow me on Twitter at Dom Damore or on Facebook as Dominic Damore. James, how's your show today? Eh, I've had better. Good night, everybody.